Islamic Islamic history and a global medieval past. We are sponsored by IHRC Bookshop. Listeners get a 15% discount on all purchases. Visit IHRC Bookshop at shop.ihrc.org and use discount code AHP15 at, di- at checkout. Terms and conditions apply. Contact IHRC Bookshop for details. I'm your host, Lal Hassan, a PhD student at the School of Oriental African Studies in London. Now on to the show. Despite many a tattoo of his alleged verses decorating limbs of heartbroken U.S. college students, the actual life, works and legacy of the Sunni Hanafi jurist and Maturudi theologian Jalaluddin Muhammad Rumi have been conveniently overlooked. To provide a historical introduction to Rumi, we are joined by Muhammad Ali Mujarradi, a University of Michigan graduate, translator, editor, and founder of the PersianPoetics.com project, and is best known by his Twitter and Instagram handle at Sharuk Zadeh. Welcome, Muhammad Ali. Thank you for having me. Rumi was born in 1207 Komanira, quite likely in modern-day Afghanistan. He would have been alive during the Mongol sack of Baghdad. Let's set some context for his life, social, political, cultural, and religious. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rumi was born into a scholarly family that claimed descent from the Caliph Abu Bakr. This is a little-known fact about him. In the absence of a detailed family tree, it can be difficult to verify these claims, but the claim itself is plausible given the number of Arabs who settled in Khorasan following the Islamic conquest, the family of Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal being one of them, also a slightly unknown fact. Rumi's place of birth is a matter of debate, actually. As you mentioned, it is most likely in Afghanistan, or in the, the general region. It's commonly thought that he was born in Balkh itself, and he does refer to himself as Balkhi, but there is good reason to believe that he was actually in Vakhsh at the time of his birth, because his father was working there. This is a story every suburbanite is aware of, however, whether you're from or not from, quote unquote, the city limits, when you are far away from your city, you refer to yourself as being from that city. I'm not from Detroit proper, as people in Detroit would say, I'm a suburbanite. But when I'm all the way out in Istanbul, when people might not even know what Detroit is, I say I'm a Detroiter. So it could be that Rumi was a similar case where he is a Balkhi in spirit and in family history, but perhaps not in the literal sense. But, you know, at, in heart he is. Rumi's family, like most Central Asian Muslims, followed the mazhab of Imam Abu Hanifa, his Islamic school of law. And as you mentioned, uh, Imam Maturidi's theology, as well as traditional Sufism. So there's always that three-pronged approach, and they had all three of those. So in that sense, they were quintessentially orthodox Muslims, as we would say it, although that's a bit of a modern way of looking at it. It's important for us to understand that religion played a very pivotal role in society at the time. The Friday prayer was a moment where all of society convened, scholars were highly respected, and the legitimacy of rule was defined vis-a-vis religion. Whether or not the rulers are personally religious is a separate matter, of course, but it suffices to say that religion played a central role in society. So it wasn't like today where being an Islamic scholar maybe affords you some rank in academia or in the masjid or among religious people. Religious scholarship really was kind of the place to be. Of course, there were no modern states at the time, much less any well-defined borders. The outskirts of a city were always a, a no man's land where only the tribal and nomadic people would dare to venture out and city people would reluctantly pass through as quickly as possible to travel. People of Rumi's class, the the ulama, the scholars, the rulers, they would live in large cities where power was concentrated in the hands of dynasties, some big and some small. It's also important to remember that in the pre-modern context, states were generally very weak. The rule was basically limited to power centers like cities. They didn't really have much say about what happens out in the outskirts. The families that ruled were mostly of a Turkic ethnic stock. However, they had long been culturally Persianized by Rumi's time. Of course, there were families of Arab stock, South Asian stock. But generally, the norm in this Balkans to Bengal geography that we commonly talk about was that Persianite language and culture defined the ruling elites and educated classes, whether they were of Turkic, Balkan, Arab, or South Asian stock is, of course, uh, another matter. Uh, There are interesting There's interesting research being done into this. I believe there was a book called Persianite Selves by, I think it was Manakia, I don't want to mispronounce their name, that looks into this 
idea of identifying as quote unquote Persian, which now unfortunately is very relegated to not even including Afghanistan and Tajikistan, but just us Iranians, we're the Persians. Of course, this concept was much more uh, far, far reaching and expansive at the time. So given all that, I think that arguments about Rumi's national and ethnic origin are more or less meaningless. Uh, I don't want to be mean to the people who are interested in these conversations, whether he was Afghan, Persian, Tajik, Turk, Iranian, uh, all of those labels are more meaningful in the modern world than they are then. He inhabited a quintessentially Persianite, Sunni, traditionalist, Muslim world, if, if we can call it that. The Mongol invasions, as you mentioned, the sack of Baghdad in the intro, were going on in Rumi's life, of course. And it's theorized that the impending danger that these invasions posed would have been the impetus for Rumi's westward move. So, of course, we said earlier a second ago that he was from all the way in the eastern realm of the Muslim world, near the borders of China and Afghanistan or Vash, wherever he was from. And he ends up all the way in the far, at the time, Western realm of the Muslim world in Konya. Of course, the Western realm would expand all the way to the doors of Vienna, but at the time, we hadn't even made it to Istanbul. So he was truly in the farther westernmost realm. So it's said that these invasions were the impetus, and it sounds more romantic to say that, but there is also another reason that uh, I will get to. It's a bit less romantic. But as you mentioned, Rumi was alive for the de destruction of Baghdad. And it's hard to explain how traumatic this event was for the Muslim world. We recently, unfortunately, saw Baghdad uh, destroyed one more time by a different set of invaders. I would venture to say that at the time, the destruction was far more traumatic than this, this era. Because at the time, Baghdad was the center of Muslim intellectual and theological and cultural life. It was the center of the caliphate. It was the seat of everything. It was like Cairo, Istanbul, Damascus, Qom, Najaf, today pieced together, all together at once. And all of that was destroyed. So it's hard to imagine how traumatic an event that would have been for the world, especially considering that it was this pagan foreign army arriving from so far away, unleashing destruction right in the capital, and we were powerless to stop it. You see an uptick at the time of Muslims talking about the Mahdi arriving or saying that this is one of the signs of the, the end times, that the end time is coming. It was an unimaginable trauma, to say the least. And it's said that, although again, it's hard to verify some of these claims, that the Tigris ran black with the ink of books that the Mongols had tossed into the river. So it's said that this was the impetus for Rumi's move. Another impetus could have been that his father was having trouble securing a good job where they were from in Central Asia, which motivated him to move farther westward into the lands where Islam had recently arrived and there was kind of a more budding uh, space and there was more room to get your foot in the door, let's say. Rumi lived most of his life under the Persianate Seljuk Sultanate of Rum and is buried in Konya. What do we know about his life? And tell us in particular about this pivotal episode of meeting Shamsi, Shamsi Tabrizi. I don't know if in this podcast you present yourself as your personhood or you represent the Abbasid History Podcast, but you're my brother, I'll refer to you. Um, people like you and I, we inhabit two different worlds. On one hand, we're Muslims, and we have our religious background with our religious narratives and hagiography and personal convictions. And on the other hand, we also exist, if I can claim that I do, in secular academia, where the secular mode of understanding the world is the dominant one. So there is secular history and uh, secular notions of what a biography is. And we don't have time to get into that today. It's important for us to understand the difference between these two notions of what history is. And sometimes the line can be blurred when we're talking about the history of Rumi. I like to lay out the main details of his life using what we know to be as secular history and then fill in the remaining details with the Islamic history. The first source of Rumi's early life are the writings of his father, Bahadin Valad. Bahadin was what we would today call an ethnic Tajik which is an ethnic group of mostly Hanafi Persian speaking people. They are the namesake of what we would call the modern state of Tajikistan, although most Tajiks uh, happen to live within the borders of modern Afghanistan. And of course, at the time, it was just all Khorasan and the name of the region. There wasn't these states. Bahadin, of course, as I said, claimed descent from the Caliph Abu Bakr Siddiq. And it was very common at the time to claim descent from important caliphs or conquerors or Sufi saints. Rumi's father, Bahadim, was a scholar and he was trained in both the exoteric sciences like Sharia, Fiqh, Hadith, etc. and also the esoteric sciences of Tasawwuf, or as we'd say in English, Sufism. This is a common misconception, actually, that 
Rumi was just a legalistic cleric who only was familiar with the external elements of the law, and it was Shamsa Tabrizi who made him a mystic. This is not true. Rumi's family had been mystics. It was Shamsa Tabrizi who pushed him to spiritual heights. That's true. But Rumi did come from a lineage of Sufis. He already had a silsila or a chain of transmission to the Prophet ﷺ. It was Shamsa just made it more complete, we can say. Though Bahadin was from a well-known family, as I said, it's thought that he was not able to secure a good teaching position. And information about where this is from uh, has been crystallized in English in a book by Franklin Lewis called Rumi, East and West. And it's drawn from Bahadin's own writings. His writings are fascinating, to say the least. It's unclear why it was the case. Uh, I don't want to say that it was because he, he wasn't impressive enough as an academic for whatever reason, whether it was personal issues, uh, family drama, the Mongols. He ends up leaving his native Balkh to Vakhsh in modern Tajikistan, where again it's said that Rumi was born. And he taught there, although Vakhsh was not big enough to even have a standalone madrasa at the time. So Bahadin was relegated to the local mosque. If we want to talk in today's terms, it would be as if someone who had a PhD from a prestigious university wouldn't be able to become a tenured professor, so all he gets is a lecturing position. And that's, of course, a fear. I don't want to scare fellow people in you know, the realm of academia. It's a fear that everyone has. So Rumi's father, given that condition, moved uh, westward. Uh, it was, of course, difficult and traumatic to uproot a well-established family and move. It's an irrevocable decision. It's not like nowadays you can bounce back and forth and visit. Once you make that great a move, you should just be happy to be alive when you arrive. So there's, no, there's basically no chance that you'll return and go back one day. It said that Rumi met the famous mystic Faridin Attar in his native Neshabur, which would have been on the way. Rumi would be a boy at the time, maybe about 10 years old. There, uh, this is kind of where we have to differentiate between the secular history and the hagiography, as I said. So we can fill in the details of Rumi's life, like the Baghdad siege by the Mongols or his father moving with recorded history. But then there's times where we have to kind of go to non-secular notions of history. There is no historical evidence to prove this encounter between Attar, who is the writer of Mantelter, the Conference of the Birds, and Rumi. In fact, the opposite is true, actually. Uh, it's probably more likely that they didn't meet because Attar wasn't even that known outside of his hometown. But it goes that Rumi met Attar and he sat on his lap. And as my father actually said it to me, that Attar predicted that Rumi would become a great mystic one day. And he gifted him a copy of his Elahi Nameh, his Book of God. It's a nice story. But it's probably invented by later Sufis who wanted to establish a connection uh, between the two. After traveling to Arabia where they did Hajj and then Syria where it could have been that they studied or were looking for connections, Rumi eventually settled his family in Konya, which was the Seljuk Sultanate of Rum, as you've mentioned. This is where we get the name Rumi in Western languages, which means Anatolian, coming from Rum in Arabic which literally means Rome, but that whole realm was thought of as Rome, not the modern city of, of Italy, but the whole realm that was under the rule of the Byzantines, right? So this is when the Quran has Surah al Rum. It's also talking about them. So it's interesting to consider that Rumi kind of encapsulates the whole Muslim world. He moved from the far easternmost edge of the world all the way uh, near China into the westernmost edge near the borders of Christian Europe in a place that was still uh, dominated by the presence of Christians who were all over the place. In Konya, Rumi followed in the footsteps of his ancestors and studied the Islamic sciences, eventually traveling to study in Aleppo and Damascus, which he mentions in his own writings, after presumably having outgrown the resources available in Konya. It's said that Rumi might have encountered Ibn Arabi in Damascus. Whether or not he did, it's certainly clear that he was aware of his ideas because the concepts that we now refer to as Wahdat al-Wujud and other things found in Ibn Arabi appear in the Masnavi. And in any case, Rumi would come to know Ibn Arabi's son-in-law, who's actually also buried in Konya. So Rumi would continue in the footsteps of his father and grandfather, preaching and teaching. Later in Rumi's life, however, the famous episode that we all know him for, the Qalandar, or wandering mystic Shams ad-Din of Tabriz, wanders into Konya. Shams was a learned Shafi'i mystic who would go from place to place, teaching or working for basic sustenance. He had totally renounced the world, as we would uh, say today, kind of a monk in a way. Shams was always looking for a student worthy of his knowledge, and he would always struggle to find one. It's even said that Shams might have met Ibn Arabi in North Africa, so it's saying a lot that he met him and didn't think him worthy of his knowledge. It's hard to know exactly how the first encounter between Rumi and Shams played out. We're going to have to take off our secular history hats and put on our 
uh, Muslim turbans and go to the, again, the theological or religious sources. The most popular account is that Shams kind of accosts Rumi in public, and there's a famous Ottoman uh, manuscript folio of this. If you can imagine uh, someone of the stature, maybe Noam Chomsky, a famous well-known professor walking through a campus with students around, you know, asking questions. And all of a sudden, the modern equivalent of a homeless person stops him and accosts him. Hey, I have a question. You're well-known, right? You're, you know, you have knowledge. And just out of sheer politeness, he humors this person that he otherwise wouldn't give the, the time of day. And Shams, you know, asks him, maybe Rumi was expecting a very basic kind of Islamic law question. Hey, how should I do wuzu in the desert? Shams asks him a question that's designed to, in modern parlance, trigger the person. Shams says, who is the greater mystic, Bayezid the Bastami or the Prophet Muhammad? I mean, the Muslims already know this is, you're entering dangerous territory with this type of question. It's a loaded question, of course. It's a test, right? It's, it's designed to see what your reaction will be. So Rumi calmly replies to Shams that Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the greater mystic. Shams then asks, how is it possible when Bayezid the Bastami says, glory be to me, Subhani, because he felt he had reached God. He was one with God. Whereas Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, Ma arafnaq hat marafatak. I have not known you as I should have known you, addressing God. Then Rumi thinks, and of course everyone's bewildered, startled, thinking, why are you even humoring this ridiculous question? You know, tell this guy to get out of your face. He's crazy. Rumi replies that Bayezid was limited, and he perceived his own limit as having reached God. Whereas the Prophet was not limited, he was aware that he was constantly reaching higher and higher stations. Rumi's reply had proved to Shams that he was worthy of his teaching. So the two began to meet for longer and longer. Eventually, Rumi tossed aside his normal life in a similar way that Ghazali you know, left uh, uh, Baghdad and quit teaching. Rumi kind of left his normal life and became an ecstatic dervish, a totally changed man. And this, of course, came as a shock to his friends and family. They certainly didn't like to see their you know, dad, cousin, friend, brother, whatever, uh, leave his normal life, be gone from his family for weeks or months at a time, becoming this ecstatic Sufi. They didn't like this drifter character who had uh, created, you know, was the impetus for this change. So eventually, they, it's thought they intimidated him to leave, and he disappeared. This is the first disappearance. Rumi eventually hears that Shams is in Damascus and sends his son Bahadeen to retrieve him, which he does. And he tries to get Shams to stay by marrying him to a relative. This is actually the subject of a play that recently, I think it only had one run in, in London. I think it was called like Rumi and Shams or something. Unfortunately, the marriage didn't work out. Shams Adin is not the type of person who could have, you know, a normal married life and settle down. And eventually Shams was gone again. And it's unclear what became of him. Some say he was killed by jealous disciples. Some of the hagiographies, like by uh, Aflaki and Sepah Salar, the two famous biographers of Rumi, although it came a century and I think two centuries later, respectively, say that he was killed and dumped in a well. And to that effect, there is a grave for him in, in Konya. Others say that he just... Uh, figure that Rumi had no other lessons to learn but the lesson of separation. So he returned to his hometown near Tabriz, actually. And there's a grave uh, for him there. So it's unclear. Again, it's like many characters in Islamic history, there, Imam Hussein, for example, has two graves. Uh, Imam Ali has two graves, one in Mazar Sharif, one in Najaf. Shams ad also has two graves. Although some say that neither of those graves are legitimate. My personal belief is that Shams knew that Rumi was too encapsulated by him and that he could only progress in his absence. So by leaving, Shams would turn Rumi from a student into a master. I think we see this first stage, which is called Fanafi Pir, or maybe in Arabic you'd say Fanafi Sheikh, or Annihilation into the Sheikh and his Divan. The poems are all about Shams. Almost all of them are about, not actually all of them, but about half of them are signed off as being about Shams. But we see the second stage, Fanafi Law, or Annihilation to God, in the Masnavi, where he hardly, hardly ever mentions Shams. And when his disciple asks him to talk about Shams in the Masnavi, he actually rebukes him. So I think in the Masnavi, we actually see this, this ascendance that Rumi has transcended the Fanafi Sheikh into Fanafi Allah, and that Shams knew that this could only happen in his absence. Rumi is best known for his Masnavi. But he has prose works too. Tell us about Rumi's written legacy and any genealogies of commentaries or inspired works. And importantly, as we'll get into more later, your recommended translations. Rumi's body of work is enormous. The Masnavi alone is over 30,000 lines of poetry in six large volumes. He also has a large divan, which is about as big as the Masnavi itself, with many more thousands of poems. 
In total, there are about 132,000 lines of poetry attributed to him. In the Persian tradition, as far as I'm aware, I've, I've looked into this a lot, he's only second to one person, Saib Tabrizi, who has 157,000 lines of poetry in his massive collection. So short one person, he has the most output out of any poet in the Persian language. It's remarkable when we consider that the vast majority of that poetry was composed in the last about half of his life. So it's only one half of his life. Imagine if he had spent his whole life writing, maybe he'd be the, the most prolific Persian poet. This is, of course, the period following the disappearance of Shamsa Tabrizi. The first disappearance, by the way, we have some poems where he celebrates his return. So it's clear that he was writing at least given his first disappearance. The odes found in his divan mostly lament the absence or celebrate the presence of Shams, as I said, the Fano Fipir stage. They also express the mystical states of Sufis, among other themes that are found, but those are the two main ones. His odes, his qazals, as we would say in Persian, are unlike those of other famous poets like Hafez, for example, as, as many have heard of him. Hafez is mysterious. His poems are interpreted in many ways. There's no one settled interpretation. But Rumi's ghazals are not like that. They're very straightforward. He speaks to you very clearly. The thrust and the meaning is very well understood. Maybe aside from difficulties considering how old the poems are, some references that are not modern or relevant to us. Aside from those things, it's very clear what he's saying. It's very easy to understand him once you get a grasp of his style. Rumi often repeats quite a bit, which is considered a faux pas in ghazals. So for example, in Hafiz's Divan, you don't see him repeating himself. I think this is purposeful because he intends for his poems to be chanted in the mystical session. So when you read poems, uh, Rumi's poems, you almost get into this Sufi zikr mode almost. And the, the meters that he cho chooses, the ozan for his poems, unlike other poets where sometimes they choose very heavy ones, Rumi chooses very musical ones. When you read them, you almost start shaking your head to the beat and other poets are not like this. The Masnavi was written as opposed to the, the divan or the odes, which were just his personal poems. It was written at the request of his devotees who were reading similar works by previous Sufi masters that he studied, like Sanoi of Ghazne or Atar of Neshavur. Rumi was requested by his disciples to write this, and he actually, it said, had the original 18 lines that I'll inshallah read uh, later already written. They say he pulled it out of a scroll tucked in his turban. And this served as the kind of non-conventional beginning of his work. So later on, an introduction with the Bismillah and the praises upon the Prophet are added. But originally, the work begins abruptly. It almost seems like everything about Rumi is his own style. There's nothing about him that's quite conventional. He narrates the work to his scribe Hissam ad din over the last years of his life. And Hissam was not just a scribe, like many people just had someone they hired as a scribe. He was an integral part of the Masnavi. This is evidenced by the one-year break that Rumi took from his project when Hissam ad dins wife died in the middle. So I think she died after the first work, and they mention the long absence since the first one. And they actually talk back and forth too. So when you read the Masnavi, it's almost like, I say, watching a movie and the behind the scenes in one go. So Rumi will be talking to us, and then all of a sudden him and, Mas and Hissam ad will be going back and forth. And Rumi references him. He says sometimes, I apologize for keeping you up all night tonight. Things like that. The sixth and final book ends abruptly. So it's speculated that Rumi actually died before they could complete the work, although that's a subject of debate, as you can imagine. In any case, after Rumi's death, his devotees were organized by his elder followers. And then eventually, when he was ready to take up the mantle, Sultan Valat kind of became the first, what we'd consider, peer of the Sufi order, the Sheikh. And the nascent community slowly formed into what we would call a formal Sufi order today. Of course, these things are kind of back projected. In my mind, you know, when Imam Abu Hanifa was teaching, I don't think he thought, I am the Imam of my mazhab. Later on, a mazhab is formed and they say, okay, this is the person who founded it. And I think Rumi's Sufi order was the same. I don't, it doesn't seem to me that he thought of himself as someone starting a Sufi order. His disciples, however, did take good care. They took great care, I should say, actually, to copy his work very faithfully which is why there's little variation in the manuscripts. And it appears that very little, if, if at all, actually, of his poetry has been lost. Now, this is not the case for other poets. Other poets, it's not uncommon for half of their work to be lost, for them to die and their work is scattered. There isn't necessarily a person who can piece it together. Remember, their wives and kids were not necessarily literate. It's not like nowadays you, know, you could piece it together easily. This is not the case for Rumi. As soon as he passes away, he, or I should say transfers to the other abode, his work is, is captured well. And we have 
For this reason, original copies of his, manu of his manuscripts of his Masnavi, his Divan, in Konya to this day that are in the hands of Hamavalis, which again is not the case for other poets. And uh, regarding commentaries, commentaries were actually written, again, another thing unique to Rumi, immediately after his death. So you see other poets like Hafez, you don't see a commentary written until two centuries later in the 1400s by Sudi Abu Znavi. And you wonder why? The answer is it's not necessary for the contemporaries. Neither is the Persian a, a matter of dispute because it's contemporary Persian, nor is the, the, the references because they're living among the references. It only becomes necessary two centuries later in Istanbul in a different language, culture, and space for readers to you know, look at a commentary to better understand the work, right? And then for other poets, even many centuries go by. Maybe the, the modern era is the first commentary we have on their poems, you know, a full commentary. Rumi, again, is an exception. Immediately after his death, his son, Sultan Valad, begins to comment on his work, and he actually laments that his father's work has already been misinterpreted. And Rumi mentions this in his works, actually, that people are currently, when I'm alive, misinterpreting my work, so let alone what will happen when he's not there to explain it. As time went on, more and more commentaries were written, of course, and as the dominant language of Konya's uh, literary or scholarly scene and also just the street slowly transitions from Persian to Turkish, the commentaries appear in Ottoman Turkish, although it's interesting that even in the era where they didn't read Persian, the commentaries were uh, written in Turkish, but the text was usually not translated. We don't have many Turkish translations. Many of them are modern because they would always try to assess or read the text in the original Persian. It's almost like Quran translations, you know, they weren't common until recently. Although Rumi was off the radar in Iran for reasons that are, you know, outside the scope of this conversation, his recent resurgence in popularity has inspired several new commentaries. So behind me, although this is an audio so they won't be able to see, you can see, there. Are, this is one and this is another one, large 15, 20 volume commentaries, many of which, three or four of them have been written in the last couple decades. The Persianate was once the binding culture for the Bengal to Balkans complex, but largely missing now from the lives of Anglophone confessional Muslims, despite their immigrant backgrounds for the most part. You started a project called Hashtag Rumi Was Muslim. Tell us about that and how we can improve re-enculturation of the Persianate in Muslim society. As you mentioned, we have the famous Bengal to Balkan complex in the Muslim world where the dominant expression of Islam was Persianate. Again, I should emphasize, this doesn't mean that the people themselves were all Persians, as I am, but that the language of poetry and things like that would have been Persian. Of course, there was an Arab counterpart to this, right, just west of that complex and also south of it in North Africa and in the peninsula and modern Iraq and the Levant, we had the, the Arab culture. For some reason, English-speaking lands seems mostly culturally derived from that Arab part. And I'm not exactly sure why. So again, I'm not talking about the ethnicity of the adherents, but the cultural expression. So when you attend Western mosques, you see adherents of all ethnicities wearing Arabian thobes. There's nothing wrong with that. I love thobes. I own many of them. They're among my favorite uh, clothes from the Muslim world. But I find it curious that you see Afghans, South Asians, Persians, Turks wearing this clothing. And it's associated with kind of the uniform of Islam, even if we can say and even sometimes we pronounce the subhanallahs and salam alaykums more uh, with a greater emphasis on the Semitic sounds than even the Arabs themselves. And some Arabs have actually commented <laughs> this to me. I'm not sure why this is, why it is that Islam takes on a very Arab characteristic in the West. I don't think it's just about migration patterns, because again, in some places, Arabs are not the majority Muslim group, yet you still see this phenomenon. And again, I don't want anyone to take me the wrong way. I don't see anything wrong with this. All cultural expressions within Islam are great and I love them and as anyone who is on my social media you know I love Arabs and the Arabic language but I, I find this curious the, the I don't want to say removal but we can say the absence of Persianate culture in Western Islam when I started looking into the reasons my first theory is the the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and we can see the Mughal Empire and the Turkish and South Asian realm kind of led to the removal of Persian as a language that was taught so that was kind of one blow against Persianite Islam. And I think another one, and, and I really don't like to be sectarian at all, is the spread of Salafism has done a lot to undo Persianite culture. Because if you look at all elements of Persian Islam, whether it be the Sufism that was very strong in, in the time of Rumi up until uh, centuries later, of course, Salafism views Sufism with 
at, at, at the best suspicion, right? At the worst, they say it's heretical. And also, uh, and if you look at the modern Persianite realm, a lot of it is dominated by Iran, which is, of course, perceived as a, a Shia country, uh, although there's a lot of religious diversity here. And that, of course, is viewed as deviation from the norm. So many people associate Persian culture with being Shia and Shias with Persian. So I know Gulf Arabs who are Shia and people ask them, are you Persian? And they say, no, we are as Arab as it gets, you know, 50 generations deep Arabs. So I think for these reasons and many more, maybe we could talk about in a different context. Persianite Islam is kind of almost absent, really, from, from Western Islam. And this misconception is aided this is generally aided by the secular, secularized translations of Rumi. So if an English-speaking Muslim were to notice what I just pointed out and wanted to reconnect with the Persianite of Islam, if they were to read a random Rumi translation, there are misconceptions about Persianite Islam as maybe being heretical or not part of the orthodox mainstream is further solidified, right? So we have kind of a double-pronged problem here. I think the best thing that we can do to reconnect with this lost heritage is to just begin by reading authentic translation of Rumi's and Attar and Hafez and others. I don't expect, of course, the average Western Muslim to be able to read Persian or Urdu or Turkish fluently. But at the very least, we can do a bit of homework and find an authentic translation of these classical works and try to connect with them. And to that end, I recommend the works of Dick Davis, Alan Williams and Wheeler Thaxton as well as, excuse me, Javad Mujaddidi. These four, Dick Davis, Alan Williams, Wheeler Thaxton, and Javad Mujaddidi, have produced great translations of Persianite texts. If you just look up their names, you can see the works that they've done. The, under these four names, the majority of the, the important texts of the tradition have been covered. So I, I would re definitely recommend people check out their work. It seems, my apologies, I missed a section of the question. The Rumi was Muslim campaign started about two years ago now. It's, it's hard to believe it's been two years. I want to say spontaneously, it wasn't necessarily planned. I had talked about the secularization of Rumi translations quite a bit on Instagram, Facebook, and other places, but it didn't quite catch wind until one night in the last, I think, third of Ramadan, the, when the Muslims are hangry, you know, they're hungry and angry. I posted about it on my, on my Instagram story. Someone sent me a page that had 300,000 followers and it was just all fake Rumi quotes. And I was so annoyed by this. I thought, you know, you had 300,000 followers and instead of showing them the real Rumi, you're just spreading it to all these people, these fake translations. So I posted on my story, hey, all of these translations are fake. And I happen to have many mutuals with the page. So tons of people start messaging me, wait a minute, I love this page. What are you talking about? How do you know they're fake? Prove it to me. And I created this thread on my Instagram and it started to go viral via Instagram. For those of you who use Instagram, it's the clunkiest social media app to share things and go viral, right? I mean, recently they added story share about a year ago, but imagine people were screenshotting my story and manually copying it over to their story. And my friend said, put this on Twitter. And I thought Twitter is the place where politicians fight and there's memes. It's not the place for Rumi. I so naively didn't realize that all of academia lives on Twitter. So I posted it on my page that I had 200 followers. Persian Poetics had 200 followers on Twitter at the time. And I didn't even complete the thread. So I was transferring the thread from Instagram over to Twitter. And I went and ate iftar and my phone, I came back. I saw that it was hot. I was shocked. I thought something was wrong. Maybe my battery was exploding. And I see that I, my notifications are just overflown. And my friends are messaging me on WhatsApp. Dude, you're going viral. Like professors that I admire are tweeting this. What's going on with your page? So I go look at it and I quickly finish the thread. And I think it was my, me and my friend Zerar was ta were talking back and forth. He's at Zerar. And we thought about different hashtags. We were actually thinking about launching this before it went viral. I mean, by the grace of Allah, it just happened to go viral. We were thinking, not our Rumi, not Rumi. And it was too kind of negative. We thought, you know, why don't we not do a not? We should do a positive statement. So we thought, Rumi, Rumi needs to be something about Islam. What about Rumi was Muslim? So we thought, okay, this is good. And we put it out there and we hurriedly create the website that we had been working on, on according to the Muslim work ethic, you know, it was taking us too long to do. And it just, subhanAllah, it just went from there. And all of a sudden, it just created this conversation. And it shocked me. Sometimes it creates funny situations where my friend said that he was working with this Persian um, culture association, I think at Oxford or something. And they printed out a bunch of my Rumi translations and they put it on a table. It's, it's some sort of event. 
and someone walked up and said, these Rumi translations are probably fake. I read somewhere on the internet that these are fake. And I thought, subhanAllah, it's come full circle where a random non-Muslim person thinks that I'm part of the problem. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, that, that's really what's amazing is initially it was all back to my page, right? But now sometimes I see the conversation in the wild. It's, it's grown wings and flown away. Sometimes I see people talking about the fact that the translations are fake, but my page isn't tagged. None of them follow my page. It's like an organic conversation. SubhanAllah, it just makes, it gives me so much hope and makes me so happy. And finally, before we end with a reading and translation, t tell us um, where listeners can turn next to learn more about today's topic and what are current projects that listeners can anticipate. The best place to find me is on Twitter. The project itself is at Persian Poetics. My personal account is at Sharzadeh, S-H-A-R-G-H-Z-A-D-E-H. I also have a Patreon for those of you who are interested to help the project. It's patreon.com slash Persian Poetics. I host classes every so often, and it's actually this is coming at a good time. The very next class is going to be covering book one of the Masnavi. They're offered bilingual, so you can take them in English or in Persian or in both for those who are interested. So all three options exist. And those are just announced on at Persian Poetics. Uh, it's on Twitter, Instagram. There's a website. If you look it up, you'll find it through your favorite platform. In terms of participating in other ways, if you see a fake Rumi quote, please mention the fact that it's fake to the person. Of course, in a nice way, you know, it's it's always comes, it's a hard thing to, know, to find out that your favorite quote is fake, but you could just add the project at Rumi Muz Muslim, or you can link to the pin thread on the Persian Poetics Twitter. Just generally helping to spread the word is, uh, is great. And also, inshallah, create some sort of connection to your friends who are unaware of this translation issue to the real Rumi, hopefully. I'm going to read the first 18 lines of Rumi's famous Masnavi. These are probably the most well-known lines of Persian poetry. I'll begin by reading the Persian, inshallah. Bishnu'in nei chun shikayat mi konad, az jodai ha hikayat mi konad, ki az neistan ta mara bo bride and, dar nafira marzan nali de and, sine khaham sharh sharh az firaq, ta begu yam sharh dard ishtiyaq. هر کسی کو دور ماند از اصل خیش باز جوید روزگار وصل خیش من به هر جمعیتی نالان شدم جفت بدحالان و خوشحالان شدم هر کسی از زن خود شد یار من از درون من نجست اسرار من سر من از ناله من دور نیست لیک چشم و گوش را آن نور نیست تنز جان و جانزتن مستور نیست لی کس را دید جان دستور نیست آتش است این بانگ نای و نیست باد هر که این آتش ندارد نیست باد آتش عشق از کندر نی فتاد جوشش عشق از کندر می فتاد نی حریف هر کی از یاری برید پرده هایش پرده های ما درید همچون نی زهری و تریاقی که دید همچون نی دمساز و مشتاقی که دید نی حدیث راه پرخون می کند قصه های عشق مجنون می کند محرم این هوش جز بیهوش نیست مرزبان را مشتری جز گوش نیست در غم ما روزها بیگاه شد روزها با سوزها همراه شد روزها گر رفت گورا و باک نیست تو بمان ای آن که چون تو پاک نیست هر که جز ماهی ز آبش سیر شد هر که بی روزی روزش دیر شد در نیابد حال پخته هیچ خام پس سخن کوتاه باید و سلام That was the first 18 couplets in Persian and now my English translation Lo, listen to this reed flute now protest. It will tell parting story and attest. Since from the reed bed I was one day rent, both men and women cried in my lament. I seek a heart from longing torn apart, so yearning's pain I can share and impart. Those who remain far from their root will yearn for a time when to the self they return. In each group I cried and wept in despair. With happy and sad I became a pair. Whoever thought with me they did confide, did not find secrets hidden deep inside. 
My secret is not so far from my cry, but they don't have that light, the ear, the eye. From the flesh flame, our soul is not concealed, although no one can see the soul revealed. It's fire, not air, that this flute does expire. Whoever doesn't have this burn, expire. The fire of love is what went in the reed, loves the burn that went in the wine, indeed. The reed consoles all who part from a friend. The reed's notes tore our veils from end to end. Who saw a poison and a cure like the reed? Who saw a longing lover like the reed? The tales of bloodied paths the reed speaks of. It tells the stories of Majnun's mad love. The sense is for the senseless ones to hear. The mouth can trade with no one but the ear. In our sadness to dark nights the days turn. The days became a partner to the burn. If the days pass, say go, we have no fear. But O oh, pure one without peer, do stay here. His water has all but the fish full fed. The days long for one with no daily bread. How the burn feel raw and naive can't tell. So I'll keep this brief and bid you farewell. Muhammad Ali of PersianTarotip.com Thank you for being a guest on Abyssinia History Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. All right.